in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we love you and we give you praise and thanks for your care for us. We know that you love us. And we ask that you accompany us today as we open our hearts to the Bible. And may we learn again who Jesus is and what he asks of us so that our hearts might be filled with the call of discipleship and share in his ministry. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together this morning. And we ask you to bless this time that we have through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We're back in ordinary time, everyone. So ordinary time will now last until the end of November. So there might be a few exceptions in the course of events, but generally speaking, we'll be following the Gospel of Matthew systematically all the way until the end of the church year, which is November. So um, now we're in chapter what? 11? Nine. 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 Okay. Which means we did a few chapters before we uh, celebrated Lent and then uh, Easter season. All right. So, let's remember a few things about Matthew's gospel, first of all. Let's remember that Matthew writes five volumes, or five um, sections to his gospel, excluding the Passion yeah. section and what we call the, um, the uh, initial discourse on um, the infancy narrative. So let me divide it up again for you like this so that you see there are five books and Matthew is following the template of the Pentateuch, right? So we, we talked earlier about, and some of you may, may not remember this or maybe you weren't here, but the idea that Matthew is very, very loyal to the Old Testament and very, very loyal to what was revealed by God in, the, in those volumes. So this first five books of the Bible, or the Torah, is called the Torah. So that's, ex, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Okay, those five books comprise the Torah. Those five books, the law, the law of the Lord, are going to be replicated by Matthew in his gospel with five sections. Each of these sections will have a discourse and a narrative. In other words, the narrative is the story as it continues to unfold. The discourse is how the action stops and Jesus does a teaching. So we are now in the second discourse as we look at chapter 9 and 10. Okay, So we're here in the outlay of these five sections, narrative and discourse. Now... Before the gospel begins, there is a prologue, and we call it the infancy narrative. Because it tells the story of the birth. At the end of the gospel is what we call the passion narrative. And that is followed by the resurrection appearances or the resurrection accounts. Okay? So, the bulk of the gospel, the bulk of the gospel is divided into these five sections. And so we're now in the second section. All right? So, um, this section I said is called the discipleship. Uh, discourse. So, what Luke does is 
in Luke's gospel, Luke takes the journey to Jerusalem from chapter 952 to the end of, the, uh, of his narrative there. He takes that to be the time of instruction for the disciples. For Matthew, it's different. Here's a special section devoted to the teaching of the disciples. Okay, so we're in this, this special section of Matthew. All right, let's look at the exact text. <coughs> and I want you to notice that there's a summary statement here before we begin the actual text in chapter 10. Um, so look at verse 35, chapter 9, verse 35. This is the summary uh, statement that begins the second discourse, okay? Jesus went about all their cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every infirmity. All right? So let's just look at that statement and realize that this is a summary statement that is often used in the Gospel of Matthew to end a section. Okay? So he's ended a section, uh, a narrative section, and he's going to begin a new section called a discourse section. Okay? So, verse 36 actually begins the discourse in chapter 9. And so when they numbered the Bible, they didn't do it right, okay? Because <laughs> they didn't ask me. <laughs> All right, uh, so he begins with, he saw the crowds and he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless. What words do you have there? Troubled and abandoned. Troubled and abandoned. And abandoned. Okay. Distressed, of course, you'd always have to be different, Linda. Yeah. Okay. Distressed to downcast. Okay. But we have this sense that they are experiencing something of the exodus. So I want to introduce that concept because Matthew always wants you to keep in mind that these, this is the uh, the... Continue, what we're doing now is the continuation of the narrative that began a long time ago when God was with the Israelites in the desert and they were harassed and helpless and despondent and, and listless and, and everything else because they were in the desert and lost. And so there is a certain sense in which Matthew wants to bring us back to the desert and remind us that this is a common state for people's lives. They're often lost, you know, they're often abandoned. They're often harassed or confused, okay? So here's the state of existence that we're in. They're like sheep without a shepherd. Can you identify where this concept comes from? Sheep without a shepherd. The Psalms are a good source. Anyth anything else? Okay, there's a, there's a whole chapter in um, Ezekiel, chapter 37, or is it 34? 30, well, it's one of those two chapters. That's <laughs> devoted to shepherd and shepherding and how God responds to the people who are lost without their shepherds. The shepherd is a constant signal or symbol in Israel's history for a leader. Remember that? Who is the prime example of a of a shepherd leader, David. David, okay? But also Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David. I mean, name them, make a list, and they were shepherds. So the concept of shepherd and shepherding is a concept that extends way back into the, to the history of Israel, all right? So when Jesus uses the phrase in the, goth, the Gospel of Matthew, it's not without a previous reference. It's not without this context that he brings along with them. Okay, they're like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to the, to the disciples, um, the harvest is plentiful, but laborers are few. So pray, bef 
Pray, therefore, the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. All right. The image of the harvest, does that strike anyone as an important image in, uh, in biblical conversation? Harvest. Oh, you're to okay, no. No, but, but, you know, yes, yes and no, in the sense of what I'm looking for is a little bit larger than the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, harvest, harvest, harvest. Judgment. Judgment day is harvest day. Because that's when all the crops are brought in and, and everything is restored to its uh, owner. And, and then there is a separation that takes place between the bad fruit and the good fruit. So harvest, this image of harvest, has this image of end times, this eschatological. Remember es eschatological? Yeah, you do. <laughs> I'm going to write it up here so everyone can remember it. Eschatological. What's it mean? Okay, the eschata, the eschata, the logia of the eschata, the words about the end time. Okay, logi, logi is words or speech or something like that. And escada is the stuff that has to do with the end of things, okay? The harvest in the Bible is an image of the judgment, the end times, the, the, the calling in of everybody where the eschatolo eschatological judgment will take place. Okay, the, we call it the end of the world, the return of Jesus, the judgment of all humankind in the face of God's righteousness. All right? So there's this image of harvest that Jesus introduces into the narrative. And he's telling the disciples, well, the harvest is close at hand. All right, that means that God is bringing in his bringing in his judgment, bringing in his definitive, you know, he's defining the world according to those who belong and those who don't. It's the, it's the ultimate kind of, this is where John makes it a reality and says the judgment is now. The judgment is your choice about whether you will join Jesus or you will, be, or you will not join Jesus. You could say the same thing is happening in Matthew's gospel. The judgment is this. The Son of Man comes, he speaks the, the word, he speaks the truth. Those who decide to, to be with him are judged saved. Those who decide to be not with him are judged condemned. Does that sound familiar? Please say yes. Yes, yes. yes okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, the perusia. All right. So he sets up this symbol of judgment, and then in the light of judgment, here's the mission. The mission is called forth from the situation that we're in. We're in the time of crisis. Jesus wants to say, this is the time of crisis. This is the time when people have to make a choice, and I'm sending you out to prepare, uh, prepare for them for that choice. All right, let's take a look then at chapter 10. That was just a setup. Okay. Um, now, he called to him 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and infirmity. Okay. A familiar enough theme, the calling of the disciples, right? Let's deal with the names because I want to remind you that they're important. Um, differences between these two names, even though we use them uh, interchangeably. The word disciple and the word apostle. 
both Greek words, right? And disciple means one who follows or puts themselves in the, in the, uh, the tra on the trail of somebody who is important and a teacher. And apostle is somebody who is sent, okay? Somebody who is sent on behalf of another. So the, so the disciples then will become apostles, right? You get that sense? Yeah. The disciples who have learned from Jesus will become apostles. Now, this sending out is not the ultimate sending out, which will take place in Matthew 28, where he says, go and make disciples of all peoples. This is a preliminary sending out. Uh, of these 12. So we read, and he called them the 12, gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every infirmity. Okay. This is a limited mission. Okay. It is not the scope of the mission that will happen at the end of time or at the end of the gospel. So, what are the principal characteristics of this? What are the two things that they're asked to do? You have to look back at it? To heal. Cast out demons and heal. Cast out demons, okay. Exercise. And heal. Are these two things related? How would they be related? Well, it seems like one's for the soul and one's for the body. Which is for the soul? Well, the exercise. Isn't that for the body, too, if you're possessed? <laughs> you want to rescue your body from the, the evils of Satan when he keeps throwing you into the fire, you know? Remember that story? Yeah. The son, the little boy who kept throwing himself into the fire and Jesus took the demon on him? And then he stopped throwing himself in the fire? No, you don't remember that story. <laughs> Where's that in? What story is that in? That's, that's in the gospel. What <laughs> gospel? I think it's in Luke, yeah. Um, all right, anyway, the two challenges that Jesus offers or the two tasks he offers. Did you have a, a point? Well, they're related because they believe all the illnesses Okay, yeah, so they are absolutely related. Illnesses are caused by Satan, and so therefore illness to be cast out is also an exorcism. Remember, well, you probably don't remember because you've been in my class for the last 10 years, um, uh, that one of the things that Jesus does is he addresses illnesses sometimes like demons. So like the... the Simon Peter's mother-in-law, who's lying in bed with a fever, and it says Jesus addressed the fever. It's kind of odd. Until you begin to understand that demons were understood to be at the root of physical sickness. So there's a, a continuity here between the two. They're not absolutely separate. But what's missing from this this uh, challenge that Jesus gives his disciples. He tells them, go and heal and exercise. But what's missing? Teach. 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 And why is teaching missing? They're not qualified yet. Why aren't they qualified? What makes them qualified? The Holy Spirit. Well, that's a lovely thought. <laughs> It's not wrong, but that's more of Luke's scheme of things and not Matthew's scheme of things. What do they have? What does what do they have to go through in order to be ready and 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 uh, able to really embrace the whole preaching of the gospel? Passion and resurrection, passion, death, and resurrection. Okay, they're not ready until they've experienced that. Because Jesus can say all the nice things in the world about love of God and do nice things and all that kind of stuff, but it doesn't get validated. His teaching is not validated until 
his actual, that he actually will give his life for his teaching. He will give his life for his, his preaching. And that becomes the validation of that. And now, once they have had that whole thing, then we can hear in chapter 28, go therefore and teach all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and teach them everything that I have shared with you. So then we hear the commission that it now involves this proclamation of the gospel. But here in chapter 10, we're just going to focus on two things to prepare the hearts and the minds of people for Jesus. Okay? So the, the, the real focus of what is going to happen is not the disciples preaching, but ultimately what Jesus brings into these towns and villages after they have prepared the way. So this is a little sort of preparation time uh, as Jesus is about to go around among the towns and the villages and he's telling the disciples, get, get the people ready for me. Okay? Now, these are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter. Um, Simon is a Greek name, and it is uh, the, the Hellenization. It's a big word. <laughs> Hellenization. What does Hellenization mean? Greek. Making Greek. Okay. To make it Greek. To Hellenize. Okay? So Simon is the Hellenized version of Simeon. Okay? But he also has another Greek nickname, which is Petros, the rock. Okay? All right. So he is first. Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zed Andrew, by the way, is a Greek name as well. And it sort of indicates that these two guys may have had commerce with Greek speakers as fishermen and dealers of fish and things like that. Uh, Andrew, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, uh, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So we have these, uh, these obscure folks, James, the son of Alphaeus. We don't really know anything about James, the son of Alphaeus. And Thaddeus is mentioned here and in Mark's gospel, but in Luke he is called... Judas Thaddeus. Jude. Yeah, we call him Jude. Yeah, it's Judas Thaddeus. Jude, same name. Okay. So, oftentimes when the, disciple, the disciples are listed, sometimes they will be listed with the name of Jude or two Judases and sometimes with the, with the name Thaddeus, okay? All right, so of the 12, we know very little about most of them. And uh, Simon the Canaanite, uh, this word very strange because different people have different versions of what this means. Do you have, anyone have uh, from Cana? Yeah. Okay, you do? Yeah. Okay. This is precisely what the word does not mean. <laughs> um, it doesn't mean he's from Cana. It comes from a, a, word, a Hebrew word, kana, which means zealous. So he can be called Simon the Zealot or Simon the intensely focused person on the redemption that God has is bringing about. So, um, uh, so he he might be the zealot. He might be. Uh, uh, he might be kana, that is, you know, urgent, feeling urgent about the, the coming of God's kingdom. Okay? Um, yeah? My Bible says Simon the Zealot party member. 
Yeah. Yeah. We don't know that. <laughs> but if you if you understand that if if kana means forceful and wanting to things to happen and 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 uh, uh, zealous, it's it's not a, a strange thing for the gospel to or the editors to conclude that well it means it means the zealot that a member of the zealot party and the zealot party was strong in Jesus' time. And they were looking for the coming of God's reign. Uh, but they were going to bring it about by violence. Okay? And uh, so, anyway, there's a scene in The Chosen. You've all seen The Chosen? Yeah. If you haven't yet, I'm, I'm ashamed of you. <laughs> um, go see The Chosen. See The Chosen. Get it on your TV. Get it on your app. Whatever. Watch it. They have... They have a, a zealot disciple who is Simon, who was in the party of the zealots, but who joined Jesus. And this might be accurate. We don't know exactly uh, how, the, how, the, how the Bible is um, configured in this regard. <clears throat> All right, so we got the list of 12. Now, um, these 12 Jesus sent out charging them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All right. One of these days I will take a sip of that coffee <laughs> and not lift it up and put it back down. Um... This is a this is a real um, uh, interesting concept. First of all, Jesus' own understanding of his mission. Um, again, we go with the premise that Jesus was human, like us in all things except for sin, and therefore he had perhaps a development in his understanding of his mission. And uh, to see uh, that perhaps his mission uh, took a turn, uh, took a turn at some point, that it moved from this exclusive ministry to the Jewish people to uh, a broadening sense of what it might mean for others to join in this effort. But for certain, Matthew is very, very focused on having Jesus speak essentially to the Israelites. And so he includes this statement, which is probably an accurate statement on the part of Jesus because it's so hard to explain. I mean, everyone wants to say Jesus was for everybody and Jesus tried to include everybody. Well, not initially. You know, he had a sense of his own mission as being sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So there were three kinds of people in the world. Jews, Samaritans, and others. Okay, the others were called the hoi polloi, <laughs> the Gentiles. Okay, anyone else who was outside of that Palestinian circle there was a member of the Gentiles. So, do not go, he says to his disciples, do not go to the Samaritans, and do not go to the people of uh, the Gentile nations, but instead, go to your own people and begin the proclamation there. Now, this, been, this may have been very, very um, deliberate on Jesus' part in, in the sense that this was his, his intention was to kind of begin the process, the, the, the proclamation in the community that he is most at home with, to offer them the good news first. And it makes good sense in terms of God's people and what the prophets in the later times had advocated, that this people was to bring all other people into communion with God. And so therefore, you got to start somewhere. You might as well start with the people whom God has already chosen. Make good sense? Yes. All right. So he's, pre he's sending them out as the primer. Okay? You be the primer, I'll be the pain. Okay. 
you get them ready, and I'll come after you. Um, so, and preach, and I'm at verse 7, and preach as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, here's the question for your table group. What does he mean, the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Knowing that John the Baptist said the same thing when he began his preaching. What does that mean? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay? Have a discussion with the people at your table. That's why the disciples asked Jesus, whose sin was this, the man or his parents? Because everyone associated. But he swept that aside, though, said, no, don't even. He did. Yeah. Not in this area here, it seems like. He's using, the, the, if you think about it, he's using the folk idiom, the folk knowledge that people had about evil and sin and all that that it's all mixed up. He's using that as part of his attempt to bring them to the good news and further in. Uh, so it's an attempt to kind of help them look beyond the, the ordinary, oh, he did this, so therefore he got this from Satan. You're talking about the, the curing of the blind. I'm talking about any curing, any exorcism, anything like that. You're saying it's not associated with sinfulness. He brings them to a greater consciousness of what that means. Okay. Yeah. Wait, does Diana have the answer? Do you believe that? What was the answer? What does that mean that the kingdom of heaven is here? Oh, Jesus is the kingdom. Oh. So if you tell me a story about Never Neverland, that means Never Neverland is coming. Yeah. About what? Yeah. Well, what's the kingdom of heaven? So he's coming to tell the people all about heaven. Back up yonder where I came. <laughs> what's the good news? Yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah, that's I know. That's fine. Yeah. What is the good news? No. I'm going to give up on your Christianity in a minute. About Jesus was telling them that they salvation through the God of the Jews is coming. It's coming soon. And he will be the person to bring it. He's telling them that? He's telling them that it's coming soon. Well, it's, if it's at hand, it, it's here. It's here. Okay. So what is it that's here? I don't mind going to the church. 
Okay, the kingdom of heaven has something to do with salvation. I'll grant you that. I'll grant you that Jesus has something to do with salvation. But I don't think it's real clear for you yet what it is. It's because Michelle is befuddling you. The Paschal mystery. What? All right. Let me. Let's ask it this way. What do you hope? What do you live in hope of? Salvation. What does that mean? It means that I am going to be accepted by Jesus and God. Oh, you, you're you're putting a kingdom of God. You're putting it as the afterlife. Huh? Okay. Well, what is it now that I? He says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You could get it now. What is that? <laughs> okay, that's fair enough. What does God's love entail? What? Of course, of course. But I'm looking like in the big, big scheme of things. The mo- <laughs> Unfortunately, that's what most people think. <laughs> no, he doesn't care if you have a good life or not. He can suffer a lot. <laughs> what? Okay. All right. So if if we understand what he, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> but they're all listening. If we understand that the kingdom of heaven is a way of life, it's a way of life lived in confident assurance of God's love and tender care. And that's how we live. So who brings that? Jesus brings that. He brings it by his own compassionate love and care for his people. And ultimately, that compassionate love ends up in selfless giving of himself on the cross and the death and resurrection that leads us to realize that this life that he's bringing us into, this reign of heaven, this kingdom of heaven that he's bringing us into, is not for this world only. But it is for life. For eternal life. That's what we call eternal life. Does that make sense? And when Jesus left his disciples and he said, Love one another as I have loved you, that is a form of what one is behaved by. Which means that's more towards the kingdom of heaven. And they don't. They, they don't accept the you know, what I have read. They have they have just accept that he was going to suffer and die until it happened. Right. But that's what love demands. That's what ultimate love demands. That one can lay down their life for another. Yeah. Okay, let's have a discussion love out loud here. Who's got a thought they'd like to share? What what does Jesus mean when he says the kingdom of heaven is at hand? We appoint you. He's speaking for you. You appointed him? Yeah. Well, he was over. appointed to each other. Oh, okay. <laughs> he hovered around with us. So we took Scott the, did. Scott. He was a hovering presence. So we, we took the clue that you said about the teaching that they weren't ready to teach yet because they hadn't gone through the the, the suffering and the resurrection. So we're going to use that as the nearness that is coming and that will bring the kingdom of heaven. But we're okay. ready for the real answer. And you'll get it <laughs> as soon as I'm ready to deliver it. Yes? I think when, he, when Jesus says the heaven, the heaven is near, he's talking about himself. Okay. I, I'm the son of God. I didn't say it that precisely, but God is here now. And then, you know, he's not ready to appoint them all because they got, and he's, and he's telling them that a bunch of stuff's about ready to happen. You know, referring to his, 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 uh, 
crucifixion and resurrection. So I think it was trying to, you know, it's kind of a setup, if you will, for their ministry. You know, he hasn't set them up yet, but he's, he's starting to, to try to educate them, get them ready. So when we say, the, when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is at hand, what's he telling them? Well, he's the one. What, what happened was, is he went on the cross and forgiveness of sins was at hand. So the kingdom of heaven is forgiveness of sins. I would call that a good, good answer. Okay. <laughs> Who else has got something? kind of agreed with what Jordan and Mike were saying. If Jesus brings the kingdom of heaven, it will be realized with his passion and resurrection. What will be realized? The kingdom of heaven. What is it? In, in our hearts that we adopt Jesus as he replaces the temple, we adopt him, incorporate his, his life, his teaching, his Yes, it's our salvation. Yes, it's eternal life. It's our salvation. It's, it's going to heaven. It's paradise. It's all those things. But it also has a, a contemporary dimension to it that has to be taken into account. You know, for instance, when John the Baptist began his preaching, both in Matthew and Mark's gospel, you hear these same words, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, certainly, John the Baptist, when he was talking about repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he's talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Not that Jesus brings the kingdom, that Jesus is the kingdom. All right? And what is it that he inaugurates? What is it that he brings? What is it that he initiates in us? He initiates a life lived in the presence of a loving God. This is what he does. So he brings us in to and helps us to attain to a way of life, a way of life that is ordered toward God and is living constantly in the presence of God. Okay? That has nothing to do with pie-in-the-sky theology, okay? It has to do with living our lives in the presence of Jesus, in the here and now, with God the Father, in uh, undeniable love for each other. Now, we say that is so vast that it overcomes death, that life in God is so complete that death has no power. So it isn't like, well, we live this life, we die, and then we come alive again and we go live another life. No, it's life. You have it, you have it now. I think most of you have it. <laughs> By the looks of some of you, I'm not sure. But you have life now. And it's going to continue. And it's either going to continue in a state where you're in perfect happiness with God, or you're not. That's how it's going to continue. So, that, that way I don't want you to think of, well, we have this life and then we have the next life. But whether, rather, we have life because God is good to us. We have life. And that life doesn't end. So the kingdom of heaven can't be reduced to that other, other time after this life. But rather, if we see it in the context of the Bible, we're seeing the kingdom of heaven as the life that God wants us to live right now. And that life is always lived in his presence, conscious and aware of his eternal presence to us. I live my life in such a way that I take that seriously. You can't hide. Okay. You need to come to the scripture study. That's what it means. Well, I, yeah, I, I used to think that, but after all these years, <laughs> it doesn't seem to help. <laughs> there was some significance to his physical presence at that time among them. Right? Yeah. 
but it also too he's speaking to the bigger picture of like he's speaking to both right. because he as the resurrected one is not limited to physical time and space he is eternally present to all who hope in him make sense yeah. okay all right what are you hungry <laughs> I'm always hungry. Um, okay. Um, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. There you go. That's the list of what you can do. And in the same way that the Torah was preached, you could not charge money to be a preacher of the Torah. Um, it was it, the Torah was God's gift to you as a excuse me as a teacher. God gave you this gift of teaching. You don't charge for it. You don't ask people to give you money for it. You instead offer this free. So that was the role of the scribe and so on. So teachers, Pharisees, and so Jesus transfers that to his disciples and says now. You've received freely from me. Go and give freely to others. And then draws them into the whole mission. All right, that finishes our gospel. Any questions? Did I blow anyone's mind? No, I've said the same things before. <laughs> it's very helpful. To... Repetition is yeah. Our Repetition. All right, let's take a break. Before we dive into Exodus, unless you don't want to break. Take a break if you want to break. I'm not. If you think my material is so unimportant as to take a break in the middle of it, go ahead. Let's look at the journey of the Israelites as described in the book of Exodus. So, 
We know, you know, historically that the Jews were in what was called the land of Goshen. And the land of Goshen is here. Uh, and they built the city of Ramses, which is right here. And so the Israelites lived for about 400 years in the land of Egypt. When uh, God appeared to Moses, uh, the scripture is a little bit obscure about exact location, but it says that uh, Moses went to shepherd the sheep of his father, father-in-law Jethro, which was in the land of Midian. Now, this is what's difficult for us as trying to kind of put things in a, a geographical context. Midian is over here. Okay, Midian is down along the coast of the Red Sea there. That's Midian. So if Moses went and hid out in the land of, of Midia, that makes good sense. He'd be far away from the Egyptians, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the difficulty comes if, if he went to Media or Midia, he had an encounter with God on the mountain in the form of the burning bush, right? And, and God says to Moses, you will bring the people here to this mountain and they will worship me here. Well, that mountain is celebrated to be right here. Okay? So, he didn't take a rowboat across the, the sea here and come to the mountain to flock to shepherd his sheep. So we've got some con conflict here with where did all this take place? Now there's another place that's often indicated as uh, the place of revelation, and it's up there along the sea road, what's called the sea road, that Moses took the sea road um, and that when he crossed the Red Sea, he crossed here and went this way and then went down and then went back up that way. You see the blue, blue line? Yeah. Okay. That's conjectured to be one of the ways that Moses could have gone through the wilderness. But our text, much of our text, reflects this journey down here to Mount Sinai, which is at the, at the tip of the Sinai Peninsula. So, what is the truth? I don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. So, We've got Moses today in chapter 19 at Mount Sinai. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to stick him down here. And the tribes, are all, or the tribes of Israel are all there with him. And now from chapter 19 all the way until Numbers chapter 10, so the next set of, of uh, writings from the Old Testament, they all take place while they're encamped at the foot of Mount Sinai. And at the foot of Mount Sinai, they're going to get a revelation about God's presence. So let's look at the text, 19. So it's, it says in the pre, uh, previous verse, in the third month after the Israelites' departure from the land of Egypt, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. After they made the journey from Rephidim and entered the wilderness of Sinai, they pitched camp in the wilderness. So Rephidim is here, and then coming down into the wilderness of Sinai. Um, what happened at Rephidim? Water from the rock. Okay. It happened here in Rephidim, and it happened again over here or here. We've got two different accounts. All right, so they arrive, they camp, they set up their tents and all that kind of stuff. They're camped on the mountain uh, or on, in front of the mountain. Moses went up the mountain of God. Then the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, this is what you will say to the house. This is what you will say to the house of Jacob. Tell the Israelites, 
You have seen how I treated the Egyptians and how I bore you up on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me completely and keep my covenant, you will be my treasured possession among all peoples, though all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. So Moses is going to give this instruction to the people, and they're going to worship at the foot of the altar now for a few months as, as the Ten Commandments are gathered together and as the people are instructed in the law. There's a long sequence of events. The book of Leviticus, the whole book of Leviticus is legislation and regulations to the Jewish people about how they will live their lives according to God's law going on into numbers, okay? All right, so is there anything particular that you notice about this? Do you think it's odd that God would have a special people, although all the people in the world are his? Yes? All right. What's is there an issue there? Is there a question? What? What's sent in the promise to Abraham? Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, there there is a uh, there is a patrimony of legend that goes back to Abraham from this. Um, but if we think of it in terms of being uh, given a purpose, so chosen for a purpose uh, which only comes to light mostly in the later prophets. So they are chosen and they see themselves as uniquely blessed by God. But God doesn't reveal that to them, I have chose you for a reason until later. So there, if you think about it, everyone has this dignity in the sense of everyone is chosen called and given a distinct vocation in the scope of the world and the scope of world events. Everyone is called, chosen, and has a particular vocation. It's the Israelites who see their nation as a collective that is called uniquely. Okay? Any questions about Now, this is going to go on as God reveals himself on the mountain to Moses. And how does he reveal himself on the mountain to Moses or and to the people? Fire, wind, noise, noise, mighty trumpet blast. That's the best they could describe it. And so we hear those three things mentioned again in the book of Kings with the prophet Elijah who goes to the cave on Mount Horeb, which is Mount Sinai, and experiences the three same things. And we see them reflected in the story of Pentecost and the disciples in the upper room. Right? Right. Okay. So when we say the Israelites were chosen for the purpose, and are we thinking, or I'm thinking that the purpose is to bring Jesus to us. Oh, no. No, of course not. <laughs> that would be too easy. <laughs> no, in the broadest scheme of things, in the broadest scheme of things, yes. Yeah. Yes. But, the, but as it's identified in the book of the prophet Isaiah and it's identified in the book of Jeremiah and Ezekiel, the real, uh, I mean, God chose the Israelites to bring the world to God. So Jesus is the means by which the world is brought to God's throne. Jesus is the way, right? Mm -hmm. And then we understand that, but they were called to bring all nations into a relationship with God by their behavior. And when you say all nations, you mean all nations of the world? Yes. All okay. No, all nations of the world. Yeah, yeah, that's what the prophets say. To God. All right, any other questions? Okay, let's look at Corinthians. Corinthians, Romans. Let's look at Romans instead. (laughs) 
St. Paul writes, while we were still helpless, or do you have weak, or what do you have? Helpless. Helpless? Yeah. Okay. While we were still weak, helpless, uh, at the proper time, what do you have there? Appointed time. Appointed time. This is the word, and this is a good word to keep in your lexicon. What's a lexicon? I better put that up here, too. Yeah. <laughs> the appointed time. The appropriate time. Kairos. So you have two words for time in Greek. Chronos, which is clock time. And then you have kairos, which is the appropriate time for something to happen. So this is a kairos. While well, we were yet helpless at the kairos, uh, propitious time. Why one, and he makes a little side excursion. Why one will hardly die for a righteous man, though Perhaps for a good man, one will dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You get the logic here? Okay. The absolute astounding love of God that goes beyond what normal human beings expect from one another. This is a very unique experience. Since, therefore, we are now justified by his blood. What is justified by his blood referred to? Death on the cross. And that's very important that we understand that it isn't the blood of a, as a substance. But Paul is referring to the event of the cross. Okay? And it's sacrificial blood. So it should remind us of the blood of bulls and oxen and different animals that were offered in Holocaust and burnt and their blood released from their bodies before they were burnt. That's supposed to remind us that Jesus entered into life to be a Holocaust, to be a, a, a selfless offering. All right. So it's we are justified by his blood, and justified means we are put in our proper place. Okay, what is our proper place? We're sons and daughters of God. That's our proper place. So it is through the, the justification of his blood and the forgiveness that is won on the cross that we have gained our rightful place. Boom. Now stop wandering. Stay there. This is your rightful place. Okay. Um, saved by him from the wrath of God. The word wrath is an interesting word. It's the word orge. And it's related to the word orgy. And it's supposed to be like a... Um, just a in, in the throes of passion. In the throes of passion, this is, this is wrath. Now, what is the wrath of God? The wrath of God is never directed at the person, but it is always directed at the sin. So God is angry about sin in the world. And this anger, this wrath, this passion is so deep within him that he, they can describe it as a wrath. Um, we usually experience or think about God as loving and caring and good and kind. And, and Paul uses this concept, wrath of God, to say that there is a justice that will be done and sin will be finally defeated. And God has absolute hostility toward sin. And those who perpetrate sin are caught up in that wrathfulness. Does that make sense? Okay. So, that wrath of God that um, we will be saved from. For if while we were enemies, and this is the, what we call the, the case of the right, 
the case of the, the heavy versus the light. Okay, so he says, look, if when we were enemies to God, we were forgiven in, in Christ's gift of himself, how is it going to be when now that we're righteous with God? How much more is he going to lavish his affection and his, and his love for us? So if we were enemies and he loved us, what about now where we are reconciled? Joy! Right? Yeah. So he wants to emphasize this, uh, this sense of, wow, this is wondrous that, that if God is this kind of being, if God is this kind of person, then we have shared in this unutterable joy. So much more shall we be saved by his life. Not only so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we, through whom we have now received our reconciliation. Okay, so he's making the case that you rotten people, <laughs> you are rotten people, but God loves you, and he proves his love in this, that while you're still in your sin, Jesus emptied himself out for us, not for the good people, but for us. And therefore, now that you are standing in this right relationship with God, you can take even more pleasure and more joy in the, in the idea of God's reconciling love. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, are there any thoughts or questions or concerns or puzzlements or... Yes? Do you think when we go beyond what we're... I'm not right? going anywhere. <laughs> so you could say when I go because I don't know where you're going. <laughs> No. Like I see you and you see me. And no. What do they see him with? <laughs> <laughs> They're not going to have eyes. They're going to have a body. Not until the final resurrection. How are you going to see God? Yeah. That's what I'm wondering. <laughs> yeah. That's why I'm seeing. It's hard to understand. I know, but you've got to you've got to continually shift yourself out of this world and think in terms of this, this concept, this thing that we talk about, which is eternal life, which is heaven, which is this promised inheritance, is so beyond our earthly experience that there is no way to describe it. So you can't say you'll see God or you'll run through the gates or you'll... What? It's beyond this. It's beyond our world. It's not doesn't use the categories of our world. This is existence itself. Got it? No, you don't got it. Because you ask these questions all the time. Who else? Any other questions? I got a few minutes. You got my ear. Right. Instead of the apostle. Right. Where does where does that come from? From uh, so as you look at Acts, <clears throat> you look at the sequence of events, mm -hmm. the deacons are formed and called and ordained by the church. Right. The next thing you hear is is Stephen mm -hmm. and then Philip. Okay. So well, the which Philip was it then that went to That's the same one. Is the, the deacon or the... The deacon. Okay. Yeah, the deacon. The deacon evangelist. Okay. He, in chapter 20, in the later books, later chapters, he's called P, uh, Philip the Evangelist mm -hmm. because he's preaching the good news. He's the one who's known for that. All right, what else? Linda, did you have your hand up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Well, I for one have some things to get in order. Um, I think in every age people have experienced this, um, except maybe in the uh, the uh, Victorian era. Uh, but I think in every age people have experienced this kind of dynamic uh, that becomes frightening. I mean, when you read the scriptures and you read uh, what the early church was facing, like in the Acts of the Apostles and stuff like that, it, 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 it is no wonder that they thought that the end was coming soon because, it, I mean, people were being butchered in front of other people and this was called entertainment. At least we don't do that. I mean, there is worldwide wrestling and stuff like that. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, um, that, that constant, you know, upheaval of war and the constant, I mean, we're not in that state. You know, we're in uh, what I would call, we're in a psychological war right now um, about sexuality, gender, um, politics, uh, it's it's a mindfulness that we've we've adopted um, that has kind of created a crisis for us. But I don't think it's any worse than a crisis that has been brewing that's been brewing all all through the ages. Do you so. think that psychological warfare that we're going through now though turns into a military war into a? Who's to say? I mean. I, I mean, hopefully we have enough sense not to use weapons for that. But, um, I mean, it's being, it's being acted out in politics, you know. It's, it's being made part of that whole political agenda. So. Well, I think we're closer than people realize. <laughs> Personally, there's tactical nukes on the north border of, uh, of Ukraine. So, I mean, we're close to some Oh, I know. I know. And they, you know, they did in the 30s and 40s. Uh, so, I mean, you could, you could pinpoint certain epochs where things in the world had gotten really scary and, and ev uh, eschatological evangelization comes out and people start saying, it is the end time, he, these are the signs. And, um, but... You know, Jesus himself said, I don't know when the end time is. Only the Father knows. Right. So who are we to predict it? You know. We talked about, uh, we took the book of Revelation, keep carrying our flag. Yeah. Right? And we trust it. Yeah. Um, from a Protestant background, right, Revelation is a big deal. Yeah. Um, and you said it's just, it was a story of the time. Yeah. It isn't a prophecy. And I was like, what? <laughs> For 30 years? <laughs> So I, I spread that a lot. So um, and that is helpful to your non-Catholic friends. Yeah. Um, is to say it was a book, it was a story about what was happening at the time. Mm -hmm. But it was written. It, it got written in code. Written in code. Well, fantasy. We're talking about how yeah. it's uh, almost fictional writing. Yeah. Uh huh. So it helped me a lot to my <laughs> neighboring Pentecostal. Uh, yeah. So it's yeah. helpful. Why was it written in code? Because the Christians were undergoing persecution, severe persecution, and they needed a book that they could hand out to give them support and, and encouragement in this. And they didn't want authorities finding out about it, you know, because it was, it, it was undermining the government. Because it was about Christianity. It was about Christianity and the Romans, yeah. 